Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another edition of the Mills Georgia Spotlight. I'm your host, Jack Ellis. We're glad to have you with us this week. We'd like to take our, thank our sponsors, Caduceus Medicine, J. Franklin Automotive, and WMUB here at Mercer University, Channel 38. And we'd like to kindly ask you to like us on YouTube, subscribe to us on YouTube. In the spotlight this week, Dr. Chester Fontenot. He's no stranger to this show. He's been around this table a couple of times, and we said we will have him back, and we have him back. He's a professor of uh, African and African American studies at Mercer University. Welcome to our program, Dr. Oh, thank you, you so much. Uh, well, I wanted to have you back, Doc, right now. You know, you have studied race and race issue for a long time yeah. and, and, and in this mm -hmm. country, not only at this university, but other universities. We've just had a mass shooting. And everyone is saying that it's white supremacist. It's, uh, some people say it's just uh, he's just crazy. Others are saying this is deep seated and it's nothing but racism to the core. What say you? Well, you know, I don't uh, buy the whole argument that these people are somehow mentally ill. Um, what bothers me about that is that whenever white supremacists go around conduct and 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 conduct mass shooting, mass um, uh, genocide, literally, against people, uh, they're mentally ill. But then, you know, you have a young black man who sticks somebody up, uh, you know, with a gun and uh, shoots them or something like that. He's a thug, you know. And so uh, if we're going to use this term uh, mental illness, we have to, first of all, make that distinction. And then the second, there are people who are legitimately mentally ill in, in this country who are not going around killing people. You know, we have people who have bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, uh, psychosis, you know, and other legitimate mental illness issues, you know, that are not their fault. And you don't see them going around with uh, AK-47s and... Uh, um, uh, and yeah, 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 you know, uh, uh, assault weapons, et cetera. So um, um, I think we need to take that off the table. These people have made a conscious decision. These people who have committed these mass murders they made a conscious decision to kill people, you know, uh, for reasons that are not good. Namely, they aren't like them. Yeah. And somehow they think that they're taking their place. Now, this has deep-seated roots in America. Uh, right? So it's not new. We've had, no. we've had terrorism uh, and, no. and people That's killing me. people of different races for a long time. That's the inception of this country. I mean, you ask any Native American, for example, about any African American. Uh, any African American, but the first, of course, were Native Americans, you know, who extended themselves to those people who were coming here, uh, you know, as refugees, literally, from uh, uh, despots in, in, uh, in Europe. And they extended themselves, ended up being killed, you see, and the country taken from them and literally mass genocide conducted against them, literally trying to wipe the entire uh, race of Native Americans off the map in America. And then African Americans, you know, who were stolen, taken, imprisoned, uh, captured, and then redefined as property, you know, in this, in this country right here in Macon, Georgia, et cetera. And then all of the atrocities that occurred after, as a result of, uh, of those things. And atrocities are still occurring, you see. So uh, this is deep-seated roots in, in America. Uh, it's, it hasn't gone anywhere. We, we accept it, and I was one of them a kind of a, a, a political and social fool's goal with the election of uh, uh, President Barack Obama, you know, whom I voted for and still love, you know. Uh, but it, it kind of gave us a false sense that somehow it things was were getting better. Yeah, that America was post-racial, you know. Uh, I mean... Uh, but we knew better. Uh, yeah, you know, P President Obama was able to mobilize a coalition. Uh, a coalition that had not been seen in a long time, you know, in this country, and was swept him into office twice. Uh, but um, the backlash, you know, that has uh, has occurred as a result of that, um, you know, simply took the lid off of what was already there. Yeah. yeah, probably no one in this town has done more study, and and when it comes to race and 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 and, and uh, the African American experience here and how we. Have and even before we got here, what will it take? And your, I mean, I mean, it's been about years. Of, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and we hear that this is new. Oh, we got this big problem, but this has been a problem for a long time. Uh, until what? Until the white community say it's a problem, we can keep saying it's a problem, and it's not a problem. Is that what it is? Well, those who have uh, 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 political might. 
must also have political will to get it done, you know. And um, uh, the fallacy, I think, is that many African Americans have that perspective that you just articulated, that is to say, until white people say that this is, you know, an issue and they rise up, it's not going to happen. When the fact of the matter is that the uh, predominantly white population is no longer a dominant population in America. It's, it's um, uh, if you add together the numbers Is that of, the fear? Uh, that that is the fear. fear? If you add together the numbers of African American, Native Americans, um, uh, Hispanic Americans, immigrants, and gay people, and, you know, other folks who have been otherized, you know, etc., uh, those who have been declared white, you know, by American standards are no longer the dominant majority, you know, in this country. And then if you subtract from those numbers the number of, of well-meaning white people, you know, who don't side with white supremacy, don't embrace it, et cetera, the numbers even go, go smaller. So um, I think, you know, and I've been saying this for quite some time and saying, especially to my students, young people who just entered the political process and don't understand it, you know, and understand their agency in it, you know, that um, this country belongs to the people. It doesn't belong to uh, a few people who are in Washington, D.C., sitting in the White House, paper. Uh, you know, et cetera. Well, you were mayor. Well, they said the Congress uh, belongs to people yeah. with the most money, though. Yeah, well, we, we, we need to vote those people out and put people in there who are different. And so we still have the power. But you can't get in you know? without the money. And an incumbent, well, they said an incumbent. And for every dollar that a person who's challenging an incumbent, that an incumbent is going to raise, for every dollar he, he or she raises, the incumbent is going to raise two or three hundred dollars. So it's kind of hard to compete well, that when the Supreme Court has said yeah. that that money is speech, so United. United. Yeah, yeah, and all that stuff. Right. So how do you? So uh, how? So it's going to be difficult to change the quote unquote the people's house, if you will, no. when, when there's so much money. Well, it's, it's a, a lot of term limits. Certainly, well, you know, term limits really will suggest will will solve a lot of these problems. First of all, the problem is the people you have to get to go, to, to uh, go along with term limits are the very ones who are benefiting from not having term limits, you see. So that, that is problematic. But the other thing is, you know, I've never really bought the whole notion that, you know, that you have to outrage this person in order to win. There are examples around yeah, the country. Sure. You're one of them as mayor, yeah. as when you ran for mayor, yeah. right, sure. who did not raise all this money, et cetera, but went straight to the people, made straight to the populace. I remember when you were running, you were in nightclubs, you were That's in right. barber right. shops, the money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, beauty shops, yeah. stopping, stopping. I know because I was helping you campaign right. when I first right. came yeah. here, you know, and uh, uh, stopping on playgrounds and talking to uh, kids, you know, stopping on corners and talking yeah. to the brothers standing on the corner and stuff like that. You know, I mean, they're, they're still, uh, I believe, I still believe in the inherent goodness of most people. And I don't think that I'm, you know, um, um, you know, kind of in some sort of la-la land. I think the majority of people, be they white, black, or whatever, are inherently good people. But how do these yeah. young guys get to be so mean and so hateful at such a young age? So you're saying it's tough. From the cradle that yes, comes out of the education. home, that they didn't pick the. That when people want to say they get it on the, they radicalized no, on the internet no. and all that stuff. Well, you people, know? people, you know, I, I was having this debate with a friend of mine on Facebook, you know, Messenger this morning, right before I came here, about you know video games and violent shows and stuff like that. You know, it's interesting that that uh, in in uh, most parts of the world that are are somewhat industrialized, even in not undeveloped nations. Uh, everybody's watching the same stuff, you know. And so, you know, you go to Africa, I go to Africa, you know. I go to other places. I go to India. I go to China. But kids are walking around with it, doing this, all of them. Yeah, but they're not killing people. But they're not killing people. But they don't have access to guns either. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's my point. Right? So what you were saying, that we have this, 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 this concoction here, this potent, we have the Second Amendment so you can have a gun, so any... Everybody can get a gun, no matter how hateful they are, no matter what their intentions are, they can get a gun. So every time they do one of these mass shootings, the politicians say, oh, we need gun control, but nothing comes of it. What now, kind of gun control could possibly come when you have the NRA and you have the Second Amendment guaranteeing your right to keep an arm? Well, we actually have had gun control. We had it for 10 years. When President Clinton signed in 94, right, gun control legislation, right? But they were going to just buy a gun at a right. gun show and right. place up yeah, but, yeah, but but it put in and the, but but the but the prohibition was against assault rifles, right, et cetera. Even Reagan uh, passed an executive order 
against assault rifles, right? And so the problem, I think, is the individual who has their own gun, right? Especially if they go through background checks and make sure crazy people aren't getting them and folks with ill intentions and bad criminal records and all that kind of stuff, right? The problem is, what does a person need, a citizen, need with an assault rifle? Well, they fear, but as you said, they're fearful. I think the fear is that other people are going to take over. Like you said, but first was the Indians, the African Americans, they put the Japanese in internment. So now it's the Mexicans yeah. and the yeah. Hispanic yeah. term yeah. in the back. Yeah. The current just keeps keep moving will. from one group to the next. Yeah. So the fear is there. So why is racism, in, in your studies, in your opinion, uh, you're, you're a professor, you have a doctorate degree, you've studied this stuff. Uh, after 400 years here, mm -hmm. will we ever get past race in this country? Is that, just, know. Is that just baked in the cake, if you will? I don't know that we'll ever get past it. I do racism, not race. I mean, I want people no, to see racism. me. In, I want people to see yeah. me as a black man. Yeah. In terms of race, I was a dangerous black man, but I want them to see right. me as a black man. I don't have no problem with that. But I think the problem with trying to get rid of racism is that it's profitable for some people. You know, and so it's so ingrained in the political economy. And this goes back to superiority, uh, white super yeah. supremacy, yeah. And, it, it, right. and it goes back to slavery yeah. that you were yeah. superior, so therefore. That's, right. that's why the, the project that I'm doing, the research project that I'm doing, where we're, we're looking at all these slave transaction records and trying to make sense of this whole thing and make them going to organize such a way that makes it very clear. Huh? Uh, it makes it extremely clear. You know, after we, we've, we, we have put in uh, almost 3,000 hours in two years working on these tra slave transaction, you know, records, right? And when you look at them and you, and, and, and it starts to dawn on you what the problem really is because um, slavery was essentially an economic thing, you see? And so you have families here, you know, that, and names keep cropping up, keep cropping up, you know, purchase 10 slaves, purchase 90 slaves, purchase 80 slaves, you know, et cetera. And these same families, many of them are still around here in Macon, Georgia, and now they are the ones that are the, the movers and the shakers, you know, right here in Bibb County. It's an economic thing, and racism is profitable, you know, economically and also politically, you see? So that, that's why it's so difficult, I think, to get rid of. And then the other thing is, is that um, uh, the ways in which those who control the narrative, you know, in America, are able somehow to convince people who are not profiting from uh, uh, disenfranchisement and racism, you know, et cetera. The guy in the trailer park, for example. So he's in there because this person. Yes, who ought to have more in common with you and I, right, than with Donald Trump and others, you see, sees himself allied with those who look like him, who are in power, in power. who are rich, because somehow he's been convinced that his destiny is tied to theirs, and it's not. You see, so that's why race is so racism is so so very difficult. I think to get rid of. Yeah. Well, I think President Johnson said it said it uh, mm -hmm. pretty succinctly. Exactly. He said, as long as you can convince the poorest white man that he's better than the richest uh, black man, you can turn him upside down and shake every yeah, quarter out of his pocket, out. and he wouldn't even exactly. notice. Yeah. Exactly. So I guess what you're saying that is still. You think that is still prevalent today? It's that still prevalent. It's still prevalent. And I think instead of thinking somehow we can get rid of it, right, I think uh, the best that we can do is simply make it first unprofitable uh, as much as possible for those who are uh, embracing white supremacy and racism. And then second, make it very difficult for them to actualize it. You know. And so that's why laws are so important. That's why laws are there to begin with, to make it difficult, right, for people to uh, do bad things in a society that's not in the interest of the public good. And if they choose to do them, then there, is, there are outcomes that will not be necessarily in their favor, you know. Yeah. So I think that's the only way to deal with it, and that's why I'm for things like gun control, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not against guns. I grew up with guns, you know. I have one myself. You know, but I'm not going around shooting people with it. You know, you will protect yourself. I will protect to, myself if I have home, to yeah. at my home and, and all you're that. You're not walking down the street. No, no, right. no, I would strap them guns on my. <laughs> and if I'm in a store, am I anywhere? And someone, I don't care who they are, white, black, they could be green, and they walk in with a gun, visible. I leave. 
I did it in Walmart right here on Zebulon Road about the last year. I was in there. I, I had a, a basket full of uh, stuff that I was buying, going to buy. And some guy, white guy, walked in with a gun strapped on him. And I took my basket over to the courtesy counter, and I told the workers there, I'm sorry that I'm making work for you. Yeah. You know, uh, if I have to, I'll pay you for the time you have to spend to put this stuff back. But this guy has a gun. Yeah. And but I don't know what his intentions yeah. are. And I left. So you're getting back to the legislature, people that we vote for, mm -hmm. because they are the ones that enact those laws. Exactly. So you can to go to church with a gun and all kinds right. of nonsense. But let me, I, I want to not play devil's advocate, because the devil doesn't need an advocate. He has not enough of those jokers already. But let me look at this thing more broadly. You're an African mm -hmm. and African-American study right. professor. Look at this thing more broadly, internationally. We have had, a, I just left Rwanda right. two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was in Rwanda, and I went to that, uh, that, that, that genocide memorial. Mm -hmm. There were black people killing another million, a million people mm -hmm. died there. Mm -hmm. When the Jews were, sad, were, were, were uh, uh, and I'm not giving these races, white people, who are shooting people, and I'm not getting off, off the hook by, by no stretch of the imagination. But it's not just about white and black. These were black people, the Hutsus, Hutsis and the Hutus, Hutus and the Tutsis. Mm -hmm. A million people were slaughtered there. In about three months. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, and when the U.S. stood aside and so, watched it. So we're saying that hate can be not just about race, but hate can be tribal and 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 because you are different because of where you speak or the way you whatever. Well, it's a construction of the other, you know. And, and the minute that you construct the other, the person is not like me. And then you start ascribing things to that other, you know. They're not like me, therefore. They're not human. Therefore, they don't deserve this. Therefore, they don't deserve that. You turn the other into an it. And once that happens, anything is possible. Because now I'm not shooting another person. I'm not killing another person. I'm, I'm killing an it, you mm -hmm. see, something, like et cetera. So, for example, the danger of, of the rhetoric now in terms of immigration, for example, right, is, and, and America it has borrowed that language, actually, from some other nations that have confronted this whole immigration, you know, thing. For example, Hitler in Germany, right? It's almost the exact same rhetoric, you know. You look at, you know, the, the, the kind of discourse that Hitler used, you know, in terms of people who were there who were not pure Germans, you know, Therefore, they need to be dealt with, you know, concentration camps, kill them, and all that other kind of stuff. Very simple. It's very, very similar, you know, to this. And so it becomes really, really problematic when you, when you see these, these really aren't people. That was the justification that most slave owners use, right? That we're not enslaving people, you know, when the abolitionists, you know, they all kept challenging. Yeah, the, the whole slave institution and said, how can you enslave people? They say, the response was, these are people. Yeah, three feet, three on the three foot of a man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, it, it's, it's really problematic. It's a matter of first of education, you know, edu you know well, what happens in, the, in, in, in our educational system, both at home and in the school system. Right. And in the community and at large. And in the community at large. Uh, and through the media, you know, the very cultural institutions. Yeah. You know, uh, Doc, I, I'm, I don't know your age. I'm 73, and I grew up in this I'm town. I'm 69. You're 69. You're right behind me. My, you, my young brother is 69. Yeah. I don't see him be a lot. But um, I grew up in Jim Crow in this town, mm -hmm. and it has a psychological effect on you. You mm -hmm. can say what it will. Not that it makes you inferior, but you begin to feel inferior when you say that you can't have access to all the exactly. good things of life. Mm -hmm. uh, you are relegated to the side door. You're relegated mm -hmm. to the back bus. You grow up with that. So psychologically, you don't just all one day become 21 and all it goes away. It has right. an impact on you. Certainly. And so you're saying that we are both the victim as well as the victimizer. We've got to have some way of, of getting rid of this stuff. That's what Frederick Douglass said. You know, the, the great um, abolitionist, the 19th century abolitionist, yeah. Frederick Douglass, said that the, the problem with race, racism, right, he was talking about slavery, right, is that it, it messes up both the slave and the slave owner, right? It gives the slave owner a false sense of his superiority, and it gives the slave a false sense of his inferiority. And now it's very difficult to have human relationships. We had a professor at Mercer, uh, everybody called him Papa Joe. 
Joe Hendricks. Joe Hendricks, right? right. You remember, remember Joe Hendricks? Is he still alive? Uh, no, he died. Oh. Right. And uh, Joe and I were on a panel at Mercer uh, for Black History Month, talking about race and all of that, et cetera. And and, and so uh, Papa Joe was talking about his his childhood, growing up, you know, in south of Macon, you know, on the farm and all of that, and how he uh, uh, would go to the end of his his uh, 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 fence and where the bus came you know, to take the white kids to their school. And he said he'd get on that bus. And then, but along the way, he'd see these black kids walking, right, going to the church, right, where the black were going to go to school, right? You know, everybody black, no matter what age, went to that one uh, church and with the teacher that, you know, you know, for school. And he said, you know, the odd thing is, is that I never thought there was anything wrong with that. It was normal. He used the word normal, right? So I asked him a question because Joe Hendricks was literally risked his life. Yeah, I know, I know. During, as you know, you know, right here in Macon, Georgia, you know, to desegregate this this mm -hmm. this area, right, uh, this town. And I said, at what point did you realize that was not normal, and then you had to do something about it? And he said, when he moved and he came into Macon as a young man, he got a job and he started working alongside black people, and he got to know them. As people, he starts seeing yeah. black people as people, and those yeah. stories got to be told. They yes. must be told. Like when I realized that that everyone wasn't that every white person wasn't a mean person, I had already left Macon. I left Macon at 17 years of age and joined the army. Right. I was in Europe at 18, uh, stationed outside of Paris at NATO headquarters, located in Paris. That's when I realized that all people that people can live together. Mm -hmm. I never had a quote unquote white friend uh, before I was in the army. I knew some. We worked with more friends. We didn't go right. to one another's house. But speaking of those, speaking of those uh, walking by schools, I lived at one point in, in Bellevue, Law Cabin Drive, and Stevens Elementary School was right outside where, where mm -hmm. we uh, lived. And I was going to high school at the time, but my younger brother, who was 60, 69, which is alive, had to get on a bus and ride past, or walk past Stevens School, go all the way to Eugenia Hamburg, all the way across town, mm -hmm. because he couldn't go to that school because of, right. because of race. So that's our history. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we solve that? We've had symposium. You talked about President Clinton in mm -hmm. addition to the, to the uh, 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 gun control. He also had a dialogue on race. We exactly. had one here. You even Certainly served as chair of our right. diversity committee one. Right. That, that can we... Is it always ongoing? Is this something? Do we need to have another symposium on race and race relations every time uh, uh, something happens? Or is it something that we just have to keep working at and working at to, until we get it right? Well, you know, I think this is a problem that has to be choked out from the bottom. You know, I think there are, there are those uh, in America um, that just, we just got to throw some dirt over them, you know, because they're not going to change. Okay, the guys. But these are young guys. Yeah, these are not, these well, guys are not dying out. I, I mean, you, we can say that about the old guys that they're going right. to die out. But right. these guys are 21, 22. Well, that's what I'm saying. No, you know, we have to throw, you know, anyone who walks into a Walmart or any place else, right, with an AK-47 and, you know, that's capable of, of what, shooting, what, 50, 60 rounds in a minute or something like that and just mows down people they don't even know just because they're not like him, you know, and all that. I'm not too sure that there's redemption for that person. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I say this as a, as a minister, you know. That's evil. That is pure evil, you know. And that's hate. And that's that, deep that, yes, hate. Yes, deep-seated hate. And I'm not too sure that, you know, we can do anything to salvage those kind of things. That's what I meant by throwing some dirt on okay, okay. Right? that kind of thing. But how do we but, solve, how yeah. do we get those who, are, right. who maybe uh, empathize with this guy somehow? They can be changed. So will right. we do that through dialogue? Will we do that through another racial dialogue, racial seminars, racial... Uh, 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 is it time just for the country to have a frank discussion so we have to apologize? We still haven't had an apology. Now, no. reconciliation, now you know about this. Uh, Nelson Mandela, and everybody applauded him when he mm -hmm. came to power. The first thing he said, we need a reconciliation right. for me. But later, after he died, the ANC and other people said, no, that didn't get the job done. Exactly. That, that didn't solve this, well, this, this, this stuff that's going on Because the economic disparity was still there. You know, that's why they said that. You know, the economic disparity. People uh, want to hold on to their lifestyle. Yeah, they, they control all the best land. 
Yeah. You know, they had all the businesses. You know, they had moved all the black folk away from the from, from the fertile areas. And so you really, come yeah, I really talked to right. you. I got all the chips. Right, yeah, right. They had all the chips. <laughs> you know, they were controlling the university. They were controlling the school system. They were controlling the, the communications. In order to make a, 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 a phone call, you know, using a landline, and this is still true in most of Africa, right? They've been colonized, right? You had to make a call. The call would go to Europe first. Right? And then come back, right? So that they would control yeah. all communication. That's why the the African National Congress said, "Wait a minute! Now we have, we we love we love Nelson Mandela and all that, but you know this Kumbaya and not getting it, right? We have to do something else, right? And so uh, uh, until you start addressing, we start addressing the uh, the uh, uh, the great inequities, you know, that have resulted from this kind of a problem." And and that, that, you I don't think we're going to be able to do anything about you it. You led me right to my next question, and that is reparation. Those mm -hmm. are the inquiries that people are talking about now. It's just talking about it on the presidential stage, whether it's just talk and so forth. And, you know, it's something that that I've written about. John Conyers, the famous uh, congressman from uh, mm -hmm. uh, Michigan, right. introduced legislation since 82. Every yeah. year introduced that. Of course, never got out of the committee, right. but uh, reparation. Is it time now to have that conversation? Well, there, there have been uh, attempts at reparation since the... But well, to have the conversation. Is it right, a conversation right. we should have? Uh, no. Well, I'm not too sure a conversation is going to go anywhere, to <laughs> the truth. You know, I'm, I'm, this problem, these problems of raised reparations and all this have been talked to death. You know, I mean, there, there has yet to be uh, a decade where there has not been tremendous discussion about this. Time for action, right? So, um, the problem with reparations as far as I'm concerned, see, right, is that first you have to figure out, okay, uh, what should black people get as a result of this, right? Um, I 40 think, acres on the mule right. would be a start. Well, they can I keep the mule. I, they can keep, keep the mule. The and they can keep the acres, too. I am not a farmer, yeah. all right? That kind of thing, all right? But I, I think um, if, if we look at, at a very similar paradigm, you know, for us would be that of Native Americans. Right, who did receive so reparations? And so did the Japanese. Uh, the who Japanese, in turn, they got right. something. They in turn, but but I think the closest paradigm for us are the Native Americans. Okay. All right, and so they have reparations, and then but they have a way, a clear way of determining who ought to get them. That is to say, who's Native American, who's not. Okay, so if you weren't born on a reservation um, and have that reservation experience. Right, and, mm -hmm. and at least one third of you know Native American, I believe that that's yeah. one third, something like that. You're not a candidate for reparations. That includes, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can go to college uh, uh, almost yeah. for free, things like that, buy a house, and you know the, that that verse. I think that closest paradigm is that of Native American. But now, if we want to determine uh, for African Americans, uh, if we say, okay, we're going to give reparations, right? Uh, who are going to give it to? Who are black, right? All that. Not every African American is actually the product of and has a history of slavery. living in slavery. Yeah, right. President Obama is one. Uh, right, right. <laughs> and Obama said that. Yeah. Obama said that. His father came from and right. his mother came from right. Canada. Right. Right. But the majority of us came from the black belt. Right. But how are we from Texas that? right through? Right. How do we determine? Well, that? That we can right. do, well, do, do the work that you're doing right, right. now. We have to do some work right. like that. Well, right. we are running out of time, but Doc, you have. Uh, shared so much information. This is something that we think we have, as you said, talking is out. I'm not talking, uh, we've talked enough, but I think we still have to look for some solutions. I don't know what they are, obviously, right. Right. but um, I think minds like yours and other professors around this country have got to speak truth to power, these politicians and everyone else making itself. Mm -hmm. One of the most segregated cities, and in, in, it just didn't happen. It's always been that oh, way. Right. What does that mean? Like you said, inequality. How do we solve that? What does that mean for a child growing up in, right. ha in the world? So, oh, so we have to, I think we are going to have a symposium. I want to talk about it. I want right. you to be on the panel right. to discuss right. it. And you can say it's a waste of time, but we still want to hear your well, perspective. I don't, think, I don't think it's a waste of time. I just think that from the There's talk. There's other things we need to be doing. Yeah. What you're saying. We, uh, in the oh, meantime, right. you know, the talk is one thing. It's just like folks who want to yeah. pray, you know, yeah. and I'm a minister. I believe yeah. in prayer, all right? But if prayer stops and you don't move it to the mm -hmm. to the ballot box, yeah. uh, you know, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Well, Doc, let me thank you so much. We're rushed out of time, but I thank you, man. I always right. appreciate you coming by. We've been talking to Dr. Chester Fontenot, who is a professor of uh, African and African American Studies here at the great Mercer University. And, of course, we were talking to him 
as a result of all these uh, skinhead and white supremacy shooting and everything, just trying to get their perspective. And all of us here in Macon, let's just try to get along with one another, no short area, black or white, no matter what. We all got freaking, we all precious in his sight. Until next week, I'm your host, Jack Ellis. Goodbye. Thanks. Well, Doc, I got something, got something for you.